Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 147, we're going to take a quick look at our CNC machine in operation. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that helps the kit business. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, ever since we moved, we've been working towards getting the CNC machine. That just stands for Computer Numerical Control up and running and working again. When I first started the kit business, all top plates were drilled by hand. Well, you know, it wasn't a hand crank drill. I had, <laughs> I had, I had drill presses and uh, all sorts of um, uh, bits and uh, specialized cutting tools. Yeah, it's pretty old school, but not as old school as a hand crank drill. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll never forget years ago, uh, the partner of the fellow I worked for, he was in the steel business and... Um, and a big steel company and right in the lobby they had a huge uh, hand cranked drill press <laughs> and everybody just had to spin the crank on that thing it was amazing the power but of course somebody's got to turn the crank so yep. goodness knows <laughs> you know how strong your right arm would be on that thing anyways the big problem of course with doing things by hand is that it's slow and last year the kit business doubled so we needed to invest in some automated machinery or we weren't going to be sleeping very much in the future. Hence the huge investment in the CNC. Now it wasn't a huge amount of cash. I mean, it was, it was money. <laughs> oh, they've gotten um, quite a bit less expensive in recent years. Uh, it's easier for anybody now to own a CNC machine. Yeah. The big investment though is in time. Time to tune it, to set it up to wire everything correctly. I mean, most of the kits that you're going to buy give you the basics and then you have to get a whole lot more to go along with it. Yeah, so, I mean, Charles luckily is the computer guy. Uh, so it, he he fit right in with it. Yep. But you're still, still working on it, still learning. Still working on it. I mean, I have experience with 3D printers and they, they have a lot of similarities to them, but whenever you're cutting something instead of adding something, it's, it's a whole different game. So the first production run that needs to be done uh, is the is the top plate for the Universal 6 or 12 SL7 kit phono preamp because we need to get them out to test builders mm -hmm. where parts are in stock and have been for a long time, but we need the top plates. In fact, everything is ready to go except for the top plates. And I have to film the uh, instruction videos, which essentially is me building kit number one um, and you know I've done quite a few of those so that's not hard to do and Charles is great at editing them so here is let me see if I can it's tough with the light I'm sorry folks we need light in here so you can actually see it but it, it's aluminum so it reflects but anyways here's one of the um, one of the first production plates now this is how it comes off of the machine so this is the finished surface of the uh, raw, uh, raw aluminum, yeah. Raw plate. There's always one good side from our supplier. They, they will. So this is the back side. So it has no coating on it, but they will put a, a plastic protective coating on this side. But we we put a custom brushed finish on this. So we still have to come along and do a little bit of um, hand machine cleanup. So and some of it is actually done with deep, hand deburring tools, but. So we clean up the edges of all these pockets. These have to be chamfered. Yeah. But the biggest job really uh, that we haven't figured out how to automate yet is as I do a hand brush finish. So I have to do um, a finish that pulls the, which way is the front? The front's pulls, pulls here. Pulls the grain, yeah. I pull the grain from the front to the back and we use two different grits and that's, it, it takes some time to get it looking great, but yeah. uh, damn, but it, does it look good? <laughs> it looks good, and because aluminum, I mean aluminum is fabulous because it, it gives us a nice chunk of something that won't rust. It's fairly easy to machine. 
Though, given the time you've been putting into the machine, machine, blah, blah, blah. CNC machine. <laughs> um, I, you could almost argue that it's uh, it's actually not that fast. Oh, uh, it's tricky. It's a, it's a gummy metal, which is yeah. not the easiest thing to machine sometimes. Yeah, it is. But when it does machine well, it's brilliant, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so, absolutely. And it's a lot easier to work with, with than stainless. And you, we couldn't make a heavy stainless steel top. Uh, we could do it in copper, but then copper has its own problems with uh, tarnishing. So mm -hmm. aluminum yes. with a brush finish and a hand applied wax surface looks good year after year after year. So mm -hmm. And it gives us a really nice ground plane to work with for all the components. And a solid yep. chunk of metal to mount to. So I've I've from the moment I came up with the top plate design, the, a nice heavy top plate design. Nobody that I'm aware of <laughs> in the industry builds with 3 16th plate. Yeah. Nobody. Every uh, This is not going to bend. This is not going to flex. You're not going to feel like it's flimsy. It, this is solid. And it absorbs any heat. So the heat transfer is really quite good. Yep. Anyways, it does everything we want. We just need to figure out how to make them faster <laughs> so but we're almost there aren't we yeah yeah we're still doing some tuning trying to optimize things a little bit get them off the machine a bit faster but they're looking pretty darn good as you can see yeah i mean one of the beautiful things about a cnc machine is that you start with essentially a computer architectural drawing right or yep. is it a 3d drawing yeah, essentially it's a CAD drawing and then I turn it into a 3D drawing and then I turn that into a set of instructions for the machine on how to cut it. Right. But the beauty of all of that is once we get the layout right, it mm -hmm. just it repeats and it repeats and it repeats, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it won't stick this variation. it won't stick this hole over here by accident. <laughs> no. It won't even stick it over by, you know, a couple of millimeters. No, it's it's pretty darn accurate. So and then of course we can tweak the first plate you did we took a look at it i looked at it actually and compared it to an old master mm -hmm. um and usually i compare them to old manual masters but your drawing and your cutout is so accurate that all the variations that are wrong by half a millimeter or whatever turned out to be always my master because yeah. i yeah, so we corrected it in that first version, and uh, of course we verified all the components fit correctly, and they're like a glove with just a little bit of uh, what we like to call slop, I guess variation, to make it easier to build on, so things aren't so tight while you're attaching components. That's probably the trickiest thing, actually, with designing this, is to get the right amount of, of, of play. Mm -hmm inside of the plus or minus variation of our manufacturing capability well anytime you're making something you want to have tight tolerances on it by default but then you realize you really got to back those off a little bit just to make sure that any variance anywhere will allow something to fit and basically we want kit builders to be able to build on this platform without ever having a fit issue right yeah. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be bending stuff around or forcing things in or, you know, putting screws in halfway so you can wiggle something over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I first started the kit business, the very first plates were like that. They needed a little tweak here or a little tweak there. Mm -hmm. And to the credit of our test builders, they just, yeah, they, they, just, with it. they just rolled with it and fixed any little minor problems. But now that the business is getting busier, it's getting bigger, mm -hmm. we need to this up. is the direction we're going we need to up the game so yeah um with any luck the plates will arrive perfect <laughs> yeah. so uh as dad said earlier these are for the first run for our phono kit preamps and this is going to be for the test builders so you know what that means yes we're going to be calling for test builders soon as soon as we have these made and as soon as we're into building kit number one the which will be the manual um then we'll call for test builders. We actually have a couple of people on the list already. Yep. So if you were thinking about it, put your name down. There's only going to be slots for, I think, four, maybe five, four probably. Um, and we've had a lot of interest too. Uh, we have some people already signed up, but we also have had a lot of people just messaging saying, hey, when is it going to be ready? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, with anything that's a high quality product, it's ready when it's ready because I don't want to send we don't want to send anything out the door that's not ready to go. Of course. But, okay. Well, how about we, through the magic of editing, drop in and see what the machine actually looks like well, when it's running. Let's pop down and, uh, and we can see a little video of it cutting away.
Wow. That that's noisy. <laughs> it's very noisy, and I I uh, lowered the volume considerably for you guys. Of course, we've got to wear hearing protection while uh, while we're around it. But we have got a large um, uh, dust collector running. Large dust collector. We've we, got an air pump running. An air pump, a water pump. Uh, the the variable frequency drive for the spindle itself makes a good bit of noise because it has its own cooling. And then of course there's the cutting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you got all the motors on the... And the motors, all the stepper all, motors. Yeah. All the stepper motors. How many stepper motors to run a CNC machine? Uh, oh, there are, let's see, four. Yeah. Yeah. Four. One for each axis except for the Y, which has two, because we have two rails there. And they're almost always moving, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So, yep. Anyways, well, that was fun. I mean, I, I've wanted to show off our CNC for a long time. And, uh, okay, Charles, so what, what came in this week? Well, let's get the plate out of here and take a look. Oh, let's get them all nice and neat. Do you want to show everybody? Okay, well, we've got some beautiful 6SN7 tubes in. Whoa, okay, I'm going to try not to knock my head against our light too much while we're shooting this. <laughs> it is right over our shoulder. Yeah, so first of all here, we got in some beautiful new old stock Admiral branded. Let me get these on screen here. There we go. And these are 6SN7 GTB, the Chrome Dome version. So this is the earlier version of the GTB. You can see it right up here. And you can tell because of the amount of chrome that they have on them. The later versions tended to have a smaller amount of gettering on them. And that was by far the most common version, at least that we see today. Mm -hmm. So these are actually closer to the earlier GTA types than those later GTBs. And they're beautiful looking tubes. Yeah. And Admirals was an equipment manufacturer, right? Mm -hmm. So Sylvania would have rebranded. Sylvania was a huge tube manufacturer, so they would have rebranded any anybody who was a large manufacturer of audio equipment, home entertainment equipment, or even test equipment. Yeah. Could yeah. get their brand on. Actually, I think we even have... Let, let me grab it real quick here. I think we have a beautiful example of a Philco. And this is actually a GTA. Oh, I, don't, I don't think we were planning on showing this on screen here, but yeah, there's a GTA version of the same tube. And just shows you the same thing. We've got a Philco brand and we've got an Admiral brand, both Sylvania made tubes. And this would be the earlier tube to this one, mm -hmm. but not by that many years. And of course, Philco was Sylvania's home entertainment division. Originally a radio manufacturer. I think they were independent, but Sylvania... Sylvania probably bought them out at some point. Yeah, so there's a couple of good examples. And what do we have here? Well, we have two different GE 6SN7 tubes from different eras. So this is the later box, which is the much more common one that you see. And it's a good example of one. Let's pop her open. This is a GTB. And these are just great tubes. This is a new old stock version We've got these gray ladder plates, a side getter, which is common with all these G GE tubes. And this one's got the red label or orangey red label. Mm -hmm. And in Sylvania's case, that means that it is a wholesale tube for techs, for jobbers, for repair shops. And it just identifies the tube for warranty purposes because you, if you brought a red tube base back to the wholesaler, you could not get cash. You could only get a replacement tube. And I suspect that GE followed the same pattern that Slovenia did. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, you, you tend to see all sorts of different colors being used, and I'm sure they, they probably meant something. I don't think they were doing anything for, uh, for no reason with the design work on these. Well, the regular label was sort of an off-white. Mm -hmm. And yeah. actually, I think we have an example of that right here. So look at this absolutely beautiful vintage GE box. I don't think we've ever found any that are in this good condition. They are just great looking. And of course, this is a GTA version of the same tube we were just looking at. And this is General Electric Canada, Canadian General Electric. They had a plant here. You can see, I don't know if you can actually read that, but it says that they were located in Toronto, which of course is one of the largest Canadian cities and was also the location of the Rogers plant as well. 
So let's pop that open. And it doesn't look, oh, this is actually a, a orangey red label as well. Well, it doesn't look all that different from its GTB cousin here. Testing beautifully too. Yeah, so we're not 100% sure if G used the label colors as a code. Sylvania did, we know that for a fact, but mm -hmm. so we're not 100% sure. Yeah, but they are beautiful tubes, and there really isn't that much of a difference between the GTA and the GTB tubes with the GEs. They both sound very similar, they both function very similar. But and you have found that the GTAs tend to be slightly less noisy? Yeah, yeah. The, as, a, as a percentage of the whole. Exactly, yeah. It, they're not a tube that I would say is prone to noise to begin with. But I found in testing, I, did, I bulk tested all of our GEs that we had quite a while ago, and I found that the GTAs just tended to test better overall. <laughs> so we've got in a number of both of these, new old stock, new in box, and they're just beautiful tubes to use in, in any situation. They're great as cathode followers, great as voltage gain. And it's getting harder and harder to find these <laughs> 60 and 70 year old tubes, new old stock, new in the box. We do. You know, we have got we got a whole network of people searching for tubes for us, and both of us work. We almost work full time looking for tubes. They're starting to sound like broken records too. Yeah. <laughs> talking about it, so it, we're it's always hard to find them. We're always really excited when we do find new old stock, new in the box, NOS, NIV tubes. Well done, mm -hmm. Charles. Okay, well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. We've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. We can reach almost everybody. And if your order is $150 or more after the discount, the shipping is on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.